Our final speaker for the conference and the session is uh, Professor Rahul Sarpeshkar. And we actually chose Rahul to kind of bring us full circle. And so within the neuroprosthetic space, not just look at how do we build systems that interface with the brain, but as part of that process, looking at what can biology teach us about the way we're doing other engineering. And you know, Rahul actually, as you heard the questions, really kind of embraces this manner of thinking. And uh, after his question yesterday, I was teasing him that uh, we should not use the matrix to represent him, but avatar, because he's interested not in just in brain interfacing, but also in living in trees. And so a little more appropriate science fiction analogy, perhaps. And so please join me in welcoming Professor Sarpeshkar. <laughs> Thank you so much for that very kind introduction, Tim. It could have been a lot worse. Um, so as uh, Tim said, I'm going to give a fairly broad talk. And I'm going to talk about ultra-low power bio-inspired and biomedical systems. But I'm actually going to talk in some ways about how biology and engineering really should be thought of in one language. And it's the language of analog circuits. So that is sort of my deeper agenda. And I'm going to show you how in a very deep way, if you do that, that can impact medicine our understanding of biology, and our understanding of engineering. So the, what I want to say is that there's sort of two directions that are very big right now that are going on, which is that in engineering, engineering is used to analyze biology. It's used to instrument it. Uh, it's now being used to design it and to repair it, of course, as in medicine. And there are many, many people working at this interface. And also, biology, it turns out, is fantastic. And when I say fantastic, I don't just mean biology is good. I don't mean biology is amazing. I mean biology is mind-bogglingly brilliant. So when I give you the spec sheet of the human ear, the spec sheet of the human eye, the spec sheet of the human cell, the spec sheet of, of a heart, I've got all these specs down as an engineer. And I just give you the numbers. How much energy, time, space, materials does it take to make this gadget? What is the precision with which you compute? What are you computing reliably? You find on every single thing biology is built over a billion years of evolution. It's just mind boggling. And as an engineer, I've built many phenomenal systems, many of them that hold world records. And every time I get deeper into the biology, I'm like, I've done nothing. And that's the message I want to convey to you. And I want to convey that you can actually learn from that biology to build very amazing engineering systems. And then there's a positive feedback loop. You can actually take those engineering systems and go back to fix the biology. And that actually results often in the most powerful algorithms and circuits and systems because it's natural to mimic the biology when you're trying to fix it. And then you find, hmm, I'm having a problem in engineering. Well, how does the year solve it? And then you look to the year for clues, and then you find, ah, I can now design a better cochlear implant by taking guidance from the year itself. Uh, and so you'll see that theme emerging as I move on. And to start, one of the great secrets of biology is it's not a bunch of dumb ones and zeros. We don't think in black and white. Our brains are not ones and zeros. Our cells are not ones and zeros. We actually think in a hybrid mixed signal analog and digital way. And I want to remind you of why that is the case. So some of this is um, elementary, but I want to go through it just to show you why biology has actually evolved a mixed signal hybrid analog digital system of computing and building things. So by taking an analog computer, which some of you probably think is outdated, uh, and compare it, say, with the way we would compute in a digital computer, so this could be an analogy for the brain. It could also be an analogy later, as I'll show you, for the cell. In analog systems, you compute on a continuous uh, set of numbers. So you're going from, say, 0 all the way through 1. So any irrational number, rational number, everything is fair game. Typically, if you're an electrical engineer, the lowest value would be ground, the highest value would be VDD in your power supply. If you were a mechanical engineer, you might say there's some minimum velocity and a maximum velocity. Uh, in digital, you compute on a discrete set, 0, comma 1. The only things you care about are the boolean zeros and ones. And that means you only care about the lowest value of the power supply or the highest value. Where are your primitives, your basis functions of computing coming from? They're coming actually from the physics of the devices themselves. So for example, Kirchhoff's voltage law gives you a free add. You don't need to reinvent it. Kirchhoff's current law gives you a free add. You don't need to reinvent it. I equals e to the x, which is the current IV relationship in a transistor, gives you a free exponential and a logarithm. It's already built in. Uh, conservation laws like addition uh, and 
other kinds of adaptation, I equals C, D, V, D, T on a capacitor and inductor, enable you to do very complex, sophisticated uh, partial differential equations that are nonlinear, that interact with each other, and this goes on in the brain and in the cell. And as a consequence, the amount of computation squeezed out of a single transistor or computing device is very high because there's no, you're blurring the boundary between hardware and software. Your physical devices are actually computers, they're computing. And so there's no clean separation between the body of the physics and the informational soul of the information. The information is embedded in those physical devices and those physical devices are actually transforming their states. Here, you're saying, well, I don't care about that because the primitives of computing are actually gonna come from the mathematics of Boolean logic, which means and, or, not, not, and, XOR are my primitives, the transistor is a switch. And so I'm going to purposely abstract away a lot of things my devices could do so that the amount of computation squeezed out of a single transistor is low. One wire represents many bits of information. Um, here, one wire represents one. So all of this looks very good for analog, uh, which is why you might be wondering, given all this, why we're not working with analog computers today. And the reason is that you'll say that analog is not scalable. And purely analog is not scalable. And that's because the computation is offset prone. That means that it looks beautiful on paper. I've got this nonlinear differential equation I can implement with three transistors or with a biochemical binding reaction in biology. But when I build the thing, it doesn't work because it's mismatched. Here, it's relatively less offer it's prone because I've intentionally, as an engineer, designed it to be robust by having a large enough separation between my power supplies. The noise is due to thermal fluctuations in physical devices. So physical devices have molecular flows and fluxes or electron flows and fluxes, and those cause noise. And the noise in a digital system is primarily due to round off error and temporal aliasing. And the signal is not restored at each stage of the, of the computation in an analog system. And that's because you don't know where to restore it to. And the signal at every stage, a bad zero will become a good zero, a bad one will become a good one, as long as your logic stage has a gain greater than one in a um, electrical system. So if you take analog computers, whether they're mechanical, chemical, like in the cell, or electrical, if you take a cascade of sufficient analog stages, noise will start to accumulate and build up. And certainly round off error also accumulates and builds up, but you typically pad it with enough bits so that unless the computation is highly nonlinear, high Q or chaotic, you're okay. And we also know that analog systems are not as flexible, they're not as easily programmable, digital systems are. Uh, and analog systems, because they're soft, will often degrade gracefully. And of course, we all know with digital systems that you just boot them up again, but um, they do have catastrophic hard failure. So if you do a deeper analysis of this, which I don't have time to go into, and you go into the fundamental device physics of what sets noise uh, in a device and work that out, you find three big insights. One is that analog computing is much better at computing with low precision. So that means if you wanna add two numbers to six bits of precision or four bits, you don't need to reinvent it. You hook three wires and Kirchhoff's current law doesn't add for you. Or if you're a biochemical reaction in a cell, you make three proteins. If they're all the same protein, all those three fluxes add, and now you've done an add operation. The problem is if you try and do it at high precision, let's say you wanted to go to 10 to 16 bits of precision, a digital system does the very smart thing of saying, let's take many one-bit precise units that just have logic basis functions and have them collectively interact with each other through the mechanism of a carry, so that a 16-bit number can be represented with 16 one-bit precise units, each of which is not doing very much, but collectively they're interacting and representing the information. An analog system makes the mistake of trying to put all that information on one wire and all that computation in one processing channel, so eventually it doesn't scale the energy required to keep the thermal noise or the mismatch or offset under check uh, goes through the roof, and because of that, an analog system will scale like a power law as a function of the signal to noise ratio, and a digital system will be logarithmic. So as a consequence, at low precision, it's good to use Kirchhoff's current law, but at high precision, maybe you use a bunch of full adders if you're trying to do 16-bit adds. So one of the big secrets in biology is it's neither. You don't take one analog unit and try and do an 8-bit add or 16-bit add. Neither do you take a set of logic basis functions that have thrown away all the computation that's already inherent in the device. You, and you have these all interact with each other with only one-bit precision. Instead, you take 
analog devices that have analog basis functions that are useful for the task that you're trying to do. Uh, and those basis functions, which might be multiplies, adds, weighting, parallel addition, a learning operation in a synapse, in a neuron, all of those operations are distributed so that many moderate precision analog units with analog basis functions interacting with each other to preserve the eight bits of precision. So in this particular case, I've shown you two four-bit precise analog units, eight one-bit precise digital units, and one eight-bit precise analog unit. It turns out there's an optimum that has to do with the cost of computation versus communication. I won't go into it, but one of the reasons, for example, the brain is actually made up of very, very noisy neurons, and that's a very brilliant thing to do, is that if any neuron communicates with 100,000 neurons, the cost of computation is very cheap. So it's actually better to compute noisy and have collective interaction with lots of computing noisy devices than to make any one device precise. On the converse side, if you have a very precise device, then you can communicate less and compute with higher precision. So that sets the trade-off. And another trade-off that shows up, and this particularly shows up, for example, in the ear and the eye, is you have humongous amounts of information coming in that are all meaningless. You don't really care about most of it. In fact, you can show that if the eye was designed with a linear CMOS imager, along with an A to D converter, and we sent that information into the brain, and you took the 135 million photoreceptors and the 1 million pixels that go out, you would essentially be sending 36 gigabits per second to the brain, which means your brain would have to be the size of this room to analyze all that data. So you don't do that. What your retina does is it does a thousand to one compression in a very clever way, and it pre-analyzes the data so that you're only sending about 20 megabits per second to the brain to analyze by basically doing a bunch of analog pre-processing before it samples and digitizes the signal and sends it out. And so many systems can be made very energy efficient by exploiting these uh, analog basis functions and delaying the digitization. And there's an optimum point. You don't want to do it too early and you don't want to do it too late. If you do it too early, you are not energy efficient because you're not exploiting your physics to actually compute. And if you do it too late, then it turns out that you spend too much energy, time, and space trying to make the analog precise enough before you get a reliable answer. And so we have applied these techniques in many systems in my lab, but let me start with an example of a bio-inspired system uh, that actually illustrates why the year is a brilliant custom fluid mechanical analog computer. So um, I think uh, you've already had an idea of how the year works, but I'll review it for you very quickly. Sound comes in um, and it um, stimulates a piston. That piston goes into this fluid-filled coiled cavity. And when this jiggles up and down with the sound wave, that causes fluids to move inside, which press on a membrane called the basilar membrane. Basilar membrane sends more fluid forward, which presses on further basilar membrane. You get a coupled fluid membrane traveling wave system. Now, because this membrane is very stiff at the beginning and floppy at the end, if you get a high frequency sound, you will mostly stimulate the beginning and the wave will not be able to propagate. It will die out because the membrane is too floppy to keep up with the fast motions. If it's a slower sound wave at a lower pitch, the wave will travel a longer distance before the membrane again gets too floppy uh, and can't keep up with it. So we looked at the, and so what the year does is two big things, is it separates out the sounds based on frequency by saying these are high frequency sounds, these are low frequency sounds, I'm gonna do a frequency to place spectrum analysis. It also does some very clever gain control with outer hair cells, which are the best piezoelectrodes known to man. And through that amplification, it is able in 14 microwatts of power to do a gigaflop of computation and sense 1 20th of an angstrom of a hydrogen atom at the eardrum. So we looked at this custom fluid mechanical computer and we said, what is interesting about its equations and the way it's architected? And one of the things that stood out outstandingly is if you ask yourself, what if I took an A to D converter and built an FFT and I said I wanted to build an endpoint FFT, the acquisition time uh, for this digital system would scale like n log n, and this is a very efficient algorithm. Now, if you did it in a purely analog filter bank fashion, the acquisition time would be O of n for an endpoint spectrum analysis, but n squared uh, in hardware. And it turns out the cochlea, because of an exponentially tapered transmission line, has a very clever architecture so that whatever spectrum analysis at any filter tap you're trying to do, you take a cascade of filters and you have a moving window that moves and zooms around. And because it moves and zoom, zooms around at any particular point you're interested in, only 20 filters behind you contribute, or only these 20 or these 20. And so the, the system is completely scale invariant and shares the computation in a very interesting
interesting collective analog fashion. And it's because of this that you get very, very uh, efficient algorithms. So we actually took this idea, and I don't have time to show you the video, but we built an RF cochlea in my lab. We took a fluid mass and we mapped it to an inductor. We took a spring stiffness in the year and we mapped it to a capacitor. We took the active amplifiers in the year and piezoelectrics and mapped them to RF amplifiers. And we actually built a chip, a very, very tiny chip that you see here that's an RF cochlea that actually mimics its spiral. And we were able to build a radio receiver that could operate like the year very, very broadband, uh, in this particular case from 8 gigahertz to 600 megahertz. And it's very useful in very smart and cognitive radios of the future. And it turns out the outer ear or pinna is also like a radio antenna. It's a very cleverly designed radio antenna with the middle ear doing impedance matching to the radio receiver in the inner ear. And so we found that by doing this, we could get 20x lower hardware cost than an analog filter bank and 100x lower power than direct digitization. So this is an example of where a bio-inspired architecture, so I think, Tim, you were right in saying avatar here, because the soul comes from the cochlea, but the body is actually on an RF chip. And you're actually taking the mathematical soul of the cochlea with all its differential equations, and just mapping it onto the different body of an RF electronic system. But they're actually mathematically identical. They share the same soul, but it's in a different body. And so this is what I would call stealing intellectual property from biology. Because we're taking ideas, and we're really taking the intellectual property, and then we're mapping it into some other space. And there are no patents to worry about, uh, except the ones we ourselves create. But this is an example of doing that. And now you can go the other way. You can say, well, now that we've learned how the year works, can we use it in medicine, for example, in cochlear implants, actually use what we know about the year to build better cochlear implants and fix them? And let me review for you how uh, these devices work. Uh, Jim Weiland did a very good job of already reviewing it, so I'll go quickly. But a microphone transduces the sound into an electrical system that is uh, converted into a system behind the ear that does some gain control and spectrum analysis. The gain control and spectrum analysis then goes through an RF coil, which is telemetered out to a receiver RF coil on the other side. And the reason you want a wireless link uh, between the outside of the body and the inside of the body with the skin in between is you don't want to send a wire through the body. Wires will pick up infection, and the FDA doesn't like them. So by sending the information wirelessly, you don't you avoid the wire, and you can also send the power wirelessly. So you send the RF power wirelessly, you rectify it to create a voltage on an ultracapacitor. In some cases, if you have an implanted battery, you can also recharge it. And that information then uh, goes through an electrode array to stimulate, in the case of, say, a cochlear implant, you may have 22 electrodes or 16, and you may say, ah, oh, that's a loud high-frequency sound, stimulate electrode one with 100 microamps of charge-balanced AC current for 100 microseconds. Or you say, ah, oh, that's a very soft, low-frequency sound. Stimulate the very latest electrode that's deeply penetrated the cochlea with 10 microamps of charge balance AC current for 10 microseconds. So you're mapping the intensity of the spectrum into the intensity of the current stimulation, and you're mapping the place of location into the spectrum corresponding to the sound. There are many other things that you do, like, for example, converting dB into microamps uh, because the ear perceives things logarithmically rather than in a linear fashion and you have to do some very sophisticated gain control. Uh, but many of these implants will someday in the future be fully implanted inside the body. That means you won't even know a person is deaf. They will be truly bionic. The microphone, the battery, the recharger, the processor, everything will be inside. The microphone's ultrasonic. They can probably hear better than you at other frequencies. And if they don't like what you're saying, they can shut you off, literally. Uh, so for those kinds of system, energy and power are critical. And even for very advanced, low-cost systems today that might be needed in third world countries, you need to really make the system small in size and have the right electrode count and be cheap. And in order to do that, it turns out one of the burning issues is power. And the reason power matters is not just because it takes the battery longer. It's because you can make things smaller because you don't need such a battery. Or you can have more electrodes, which means it makes you more robust in noise. And you can change the size to something that a surgeon will be happy with. So taking the same cue from biology, we delayed digitization in a cochlear implant processor. Uh, that was the blood, sweat, tears, and toil of five of my graduate students um, over some time in my lab. Uh, but we basically built an ultra-low power microphone front end with an AGC, and we had enough programmability in the system such that a, just like a digital system, we could program 86 patient parameters with 373 bits. 
and a cochlear implant subject took out her processor and put our processor in, and she understood speech with it on the first try. She thought it sounded, the gain control sounded a little quacky, uh, and um, that it turns out we uh, could fix. So this system actually is robust to many sources of noise, like biology is, because of feedback loops, and um, it's in the process of being investigated for commercialization. So I want to now show you an example of a system where we actually look at what the biology does, and we built another chip that actually learned from how biology samples the auditory nerve to improve um, the hearing of music in patients. So one of the big two things that are going on now uh, with hearing and cochlear implants is everything works well when everything is clean. You can take just about any algorithm, an FFT or something, and in clean speech, everyone's going to do just as well as you. But if I turn up the noise in the environment in a cocktail party, or I ask a profoundly deaf patient with a cochlear implant to hear music, it sounds terrible. And let me show you why it sounds terrible. So this is what you or I would hear if we listen to jazz music. Can we, uh, OK. Can we turn it up a bit? OK, I'm going to play it again. So here's the original music. That's what they would hear. Now, you may say, why would they hear that? And it's because we haven't encoded the phase information in music. And the phase in music is critical. In speech, you can take a 10 millisecond of speech and flip it around, which means you're completely inverting the phase by 180 degrees, and you won't hear the difference. It'll sound like whispered speech, because phase information doesn't matter for speech that much. But in music, phase information in the spectrum is critical. Otherwise, all you're going to get is this modulated rhythm. But why don't we send phase information in a cochlear implant to patients? Because it's very energy expensive to do so. In order to send phase information, it's not enough to just know whether this part of the spectrum has high energy or not. I have to get the sine or cosine right, which means I have to get fine sampling in time of every single detail in the signal. And that costs a lot of energy because that means I have to stimulate at that speed. And if I stimulate at that speed, A, the patients may not get it because of low-pass filtering, and my energy will go through the roof, which is why most cochlear implants don't have that. So we said, well, how does the ear do it? It turns out the ear actually samples in a very clever way by phase locking to loud sounds more than soft sounds, and therefore preserving the phase information, but sampling in a stochastic fashion, not in a, a clocked fashion like an engineer would at a fixed sampling rate, but it actually has the information generate the clock so that it automatically samples at the right time. It samples more when the sound is louder and less when the sound is softer on that channel. And it has an asynchronous stochastic strategy that actually does its sampling. So we copied that strategy of sampling in the year, and we did it by having a set of uh, channels compete with each other in such a way that the loudest one would be sampled more and the softest channel would be sampled less, but yet they would all be sampled in such a way that would encode the phase information and yet would be at six times lower sampling rate and energy. So then you can take that and you can reconstruct the sound based on that information in envelope and phase and say, what does it sound like, which is very predictive of how patients actually do. So let me show you what it sounds like. If you take the original sound, So it doesn't sound as good as the original sound, but it does sound a lot better than not having any phase in it, and you can more or less get it. Uh, so this algorithm, the asynchronous uh, stochastic sampling, is something that's actually mimicking what the auditory nerve does. And we have actually used some of these ideas also in vision, although I will not talk about them. It turns out the ear and the eye have many, many deep similarities. If you map time into space and you map 1D into 2D, even the architectures, the feedback architectures of coupled transmission lines in the ear and the eye are very similar. So you can take algorithms that work in hearing and literally map them one for one into vision, which we've done. Um, so this is an example of that. Here's another example of a ear inspired companding algorithm. I'm showing you a very noisy spectrum. Uh, so I don't know if you can see it, but this has a lot of uh, intentional junk in it. And I believe it's a spectrum of the spectrogram of the word sun. So you have time on the x-axis and the spectral channels on the other. Because the year has a very clever nonlinear gain control algorithm called two-tone suppression, it actually sharpens up and cleans up the spectrum uh, without degrading uh, resolution. So it turns out by copying that, we were able to create an algorithm. And that algorithm has now been actually tested on deaf patients. 
and shown to improve their uh, perception of speech in noise. So what I've told you so far is bio-inspired stuff. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that we do in my lab that isn't bio-inspired, that is just raw engineering that you have to do to get a cochlear implant to work. I'll feature uh, three of these. Uh, the latest one is an energy recycling adiabatic stimulator. So it turns out that when you stimulate the nerve, you have to get a charge balance and have an AC pulse when you're going down and then coming back up. So my student, Scott Arfin, was able to figure out that if you actually copied some of the ideas of recycling the energy that show up in braking cars, so you know that in hybrid cars, when you brake and you reverse the direction of acceleration, you can recycle some of that energy, store it, and then use it again. So we were actually able to copy that idea electrically, recycle the energy, store it, and stimulate in an adiabatic fashion so that the power supply voltage was always just higher than needed to stimulate and adapt it. Uh, it turns out mitochondria do this as well in an adiabatic fashion. And so by combining the energy recycling, the adiabatic nature, and feedback current regulation, uh, we were able to reduce the power of neural stimulators by a factor of two and a half to three, and potentially we could get order of magnitude improvements in the future. This is very important because deep brain stimulators, cardiac pacemakers, cochlear implants, many brain implants of the future uh, will, can all use such a stimulator. Uh, my student, Pak, built uh, the world's lowest power uh, neural amplifier. It's a micropower neural amplifier, and that allows you now to do closed loop uh, systems so that you don't just stimulate them, but you can see what happens and then telemeter the system out through back telemetry. Uh, my student, Michael Baker, figured out how to do very energy efficient wireless recharging that was set by the fundamental limits of physics. So that's very energy efficient. And my former student, uh, Samujit Mandal, figured out how to do very energy efficient wireless telemetry at one nanojoule per bit uh, impedance modulation so you could both send data into the brain or into a cochlear implant and get data out of the brain or out of a cochlear implant. And he did it by using a technique called impedance modulation so that there's very little heat dissipation inside the tissue. You basically short or open your circuit inside the tissue, and you measure the impedance change that's reflected outside. So most of the power dissipation of the telemetry is on the outside. Wow. Five minutes, says Tim, which means, um, OK, I'm going to have to somehow make it. Why don't we say seven? It's a prime number. They're both prime. OK. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to race a little bit. but. We take the kinds of systems that we built and we put them together and we test them in animals in collaboration with other researchers. So for example, this is a friend of mine, Professor Michael Fee at MIT, who's a neurophysiologist. He took one of our wireless neural stimulators and stimulated the brain of a bird with it. And you can see the bird is normally singing and then we stimulate it. So it goes, kitch, 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 kitch. We stimulate it and it stops singing, which means we have a wireless remote control on the song of the bird and we can turn it off uh, when we want. Now, this might sound cruel to you, but actually the birds are much happier because they don't have a wireless umbilical cord when they're being recorded and studied. And so they can actually they sing more and they're free to move around the cage. And we only stimulate them every now and then when they start singing. And they get confused and then they restart singing again. It's just they suddenly they get stimulated. But this proves basically that you can stimulate and get an effect in the brain, like people were saying. Um, so that's one of the systems. This is another system that's geared more towards paralysis and blindness. So here in blindness, we're actually stimulating other regions of the brain, the lateral geniculate nucleus or the V1, rather than the retina. Uh, and so this system needs to get data out of the brain. And so we use our system with the neural amplifier and such. And we test it on monkeys. Since I've only got five minutes, I'm going to move on. And I'm actually going to move on in a slightly different direction now. And I've Many of the talks have suggested that electrical stimulation of nerve in the heart, in the brain, in the muscle is going to basically be very therapeutic in medicine. And so there, electrical engineering is a very obvious application in these three medical uh, systems because they are electrical. But what I want to focus on now is I want to tell you that I believe actually electrical engineering applies to the entire body because the entire body is a circuit. And I'm going to show you that because the entire body is a circuit, if you think of it as a circuit, you can actually do all kinds of medical therapies, uh, including gene therapies, where you bring the principles of circuit design, like I've told you with analog circuits, to change it. So let me start by telling you, first of all, uh, why the cell is a circuit. This is the circuit of a cell. So all of you think your cells are some dumb little one micron sized things on your skin that are doing whatever they're doing. It turns out they're the most brilliant supercomputers on the planet. 
a single cell, and I'm just showing you one over here, has got complex signals that are coming in, complex signals that are going out. This looks like a PC board to an electrical engineer. There's a program that triggers the cell to commit suicide when, it's, when it thinks it's got cancer or DNA damage or is infected by the virus. Uh, if the glucose level goes up and it's a beta cell, it might release insulin. There are all these pathways with feedback loops and redundancies and hybrid analog digital circuits that make the cell work. If you look at the specification of a cell, our world's best super nanotechnology computer looks like a kindergarten piece of crap. So, for example, here is the specification of a cell. 10 micron overall cell, this is a mammalian cell, an E. coli cell is better. 10 to the 7 ATP consuming biochemical operations per second, which means a single cell in your body is consuming about a picowatt and you have 100 trillion of them. So the brain, it turns out, is impressive energy compared with the energy efficiency of a computer. But compared with the energy efficiency of an average cell, a neuron is actually very power hungry. Uh, its power consumption is more like 0.6 nanowatts. So if you look at the 30,000 no gene protein molecular network that you can build in a cell with nanoscale devices, the reason a cell is very impressive is it's 20 kT per molecular operation. So even at the end of Moore's law at 2035 or whatever, nobody thinks we're going to do better than 100 to 1,000 kT. And right now we're doing something like 10,000 kT to 10 to the 5 kT in our advanced nanotechnology devices. So the cell is working with humongously small amounts of energy at the nanoscale with these elementary biochemical molecular operations at 0.36 nanometers difference in a base pair. So for example, if a transcription factor binds and moves over a slightly little bit on the DNA, you're going to get a retinoic acid receptor versus a vitamin D receptor. And uh, so it turns out it's a nanoscale device, self-assembled, and it does additive manufacturing. Why does the cell do additive manufacturing? Well, it's got an alphabet of the amino acids that's digitally encoded in the DNA. It combines them together with the amino acids to make whatever it is you want, all combinatorial expressions. And the interesting thing is it's additive and subtractive. The thing that you made can come back and affect what it is you made and degrade it so that you can have a very complex program that's built up in the cell. And I mean, the most obvious example about this is the self-assembly of a human baby. You start out nine months later, after 47 cell divisions, one fertilized egg cell goes through this complex program of differentiation and self-assembly and additive manufacturing to actually make a human, um, which is just phenomenal. Uh, so if you look at this, you see that the uh, cell is really quite amazing. And the reason I'm focusing on a cell is I think it's underappreciated. It's very appreciated that our brains are amazing, but it's not appreciated that our cells are amazing. And the brain has actually inherited a lot of this amazing stuff. So it turns out that fortunately, cells and electronics have a very, very deep connection to each other. So if you look at a particular region of operation called subthreshold electronics, and you look at how biochemical binding reactions in a cell work, Reactants make products and there's an energy barrier to them and an enzyme is a molecule that lowers the energy barrier. So in a chemical reaction, when the enzyme comes in, the rate of flow of going from chemical reactants to products increases. The rate of flow of going from products to reactants increases as well because the energy barrier is lowered. The difference between the two molecular flows causes the net rate of the chemical reaction. The Poisson shot noise of the forward and the reverse flows causes the noise of the reaction. If you look at how a transistor works, an electron starts out at the source of the transistor, which is one of the terminals you hook up to. A gate voltage acts like an enzyme. It lowers the energy barrier. It increases the rate at which an electron goes from source to drain and gives you an electronic current. It also increases the rate at which an electron starts out at the drain and goes back to the source to give you an electronic current. The difference between the two electronic currents is the net electronic current, like the net rate of the molecular reaction. And it turns out the noise is the sum of the two shot noises of the forward and reverse electronic current. So by realizing this deep analogy between biochemical binding reactions, which are ubiquitous in cells, cell-cell interactions, hormone interactions, neural interactions, we realized we could basically build a digitally programmable analog computer that could mimic these reactions and lightning fast in a compact fa fashion, create what the a re a chem biochemical reaction pathway might be doing. So in this particular case, we were just limited by how fast we could take data off the chip but we could already get a speed up of about uh, 30x in our simulation time. Now, the reason this is important is for many systems biology diseases like cancer and diabetes, we actually want to understand what is going on in all of these pathways, which are very susceptible to noise and stochastics, and drug treatments will work on one cancer cell but not another cell. 
And it turns out we cannot even simulate with our supercomputers 30 stochastic variables uh, in reasonable time. For example, a six state variable nonlinear stochastic dynamical system in the cell would take seven hours to stimulate in the Kopasi. Uh, so this means that we can actually instead build an analog supercomputer that mimics these reactions that's digitally programmable and actually build an analog supercomputer for synthetic biology and systems biology and also for simulating neurons. And this shows you that we can go in the other direction as well. We can take a circuit in bacteria that was built by my postdoc. And this is a circuit in a bacterium that's basically making a particular uh, protein. And that protein acts as a transcription factor. And then you can measure the GFP. And it maps very directly to an elementary, almost freshman electrical engineering analog circuit uh, that you would study. And it's actually very beautiful in symmetry as well, meaning if you have a repressor that's derepressed, the current goes left, left. If you have an activator, the current goes right, right, exactly like the biology works. And so you can see that we can actually match the biological fluorescence data very nicely with these analog circuits. This is actually showing you that a MATLAB uh, and the circuit simulation, as well as the actual data from a bacterium are all the same. And so we're now attempting to actually build analog supercomputers that can be used for rapid simulations of synthetic biology, if you want to genetically re-engineer a cell for certain diseases, uh, or for systems biology to understand what is going on and figuring out what particular nodes and genes that when knocked out may have some problem, just like an engineer would go to a PCB and say, what's wrong? The circuit's not working. Is this node shorted? Is it open? Is that overexpressed? Is it underexpressed? And it turns out that many of these techniques were figured out in analog circuit design uh, uh, quite a long time ago. So Tim, how am I doing? One minute. Wow. Was that with the seven or the five? Uh, next prime. Oh, next prime number. OK. So uh, I'm going to summarize uh, what I said. And uh, there were three big insights. Biology is not a set of ones and zeros. It's actually got soft and hard nonlinearities. And that's one of its great powers, and its ability to learn and compute in an energy efficient fashion. So you can give me anything you want. And if you don't limit the energy, time, and amount of materials it takes to do it and the precision of your computation, I don't care. So when somebody told me that Kasparov had, whatever Deep Blue had beat Kasparov or some other computer had beat him, my question is, reduce the computer to the size of two pizza slices, have it compute with 14.6 watts of power, and those number of devices. And then let's see if that computer can take on Kasparov or the Jeopardy champion. Because if you don't equate energy, time, and space, and computation is free, that's not a fair comparison. There's a deep link between energy and information. And information is represented by the states of physical variables. So anything you say about how information is processed deeply ties into the energy. And that's kind of the big theme uh, of a book that I recently wrote that showed, for example, that there are 10 universal principles of low power design, and they apply whether it's analog, digital, biology, electronics, or cars. In fact, many of the principles of low power design can be used to design a low power car. And the reason trains are efficient over cars is because they work in a slow and parallel fashion, just like electrical circuits work in a slow and parallel fashion and are efficient. So the deep theme that I want to come back to is that there's a connection between biology and engineering in a positive feedback loop. You really, if you deeply understand the biology, you can get insights to design interesting engineering systems like the RF cochlea in these hybrid analog digital ways. You can take those insights and improve the design of circuits in medicine and devices in medicine. Uh, and you can go back the other way. You can then say, oh, I've got these interesting circuits. Now can I go in and re-engineer a cell? Can I stimulate it electrically, chemically with inducer molecules and fix its circuit? So in my view, the entire world is an analog circuit. And when I say the entire world is an analog circuit, I don't mean just some part of the world. I mean mechanics, chemi chemistry, physics. I know I can do quantum mechanics with an imaginary capacitor, uh, all of circuit design and electrical engineering. And I think it is the right abstraction language for understanding biology because it's not overly complex, uh, simple like a logic gate or overly complex like a differential equation, you actually have these pictorial right brains of ways of understanding things that you can map uh, to both therapies in medicine and for designing interesting engineering uh, architectures. So I think I'm going to say thank you. Time for a few questions from the floor.
Hi, that was fascinating. Uh, great you. talk to end the, the morning with. Um, I'm Douglas Eck from Google. And I'm wondering if you can comment on the cost of producing the, the analog digital package for the cochlea and, and how might that show up um, in our cell phones or other consumer electronic devices a few years down the road to save us some power and give us um, better, better microphones? Yeah, that's actually a very good question. So it turns out many of these analog systems can be fabricated in very ancient technologies. For example, this one was done in one and a half micron. So the cost of a one and a half micron technology for a big die size is very, very cheap. And in fact, it's better to not use the most aggressive technology node in these analog systems. So it turns out the costs are cheap. Um, silicon can be made in mass costs of easily 15 cents, 6 cents per square millimeter. This is much less because the technology is lower. And so it turns out that by doing that, you also reduce the cost of the DSP as well as the A to D. And that's because they don't have to work at such high bandwidth. You can now do a lower power digital system or a lower power A to D that's working at slower speed and slower position. So that's one of the big advantages in thinking of it as a system and repartitioning the analog digital divide so that the analog is doing a lot of the gory computation and then handing it off to the digital later. So that's an excellent question. Uh, I'm currently working on um, commercializing some of this for medical devices, but certainly many of these things can be used in audio devices, cell phones. The compounding algorithm I told you has been applied in speech recognition for improving speech recognition front ends that are robust in noise. Uh, we've also made electronic vocal tracts, and we've put the vocal tract in a feedback loop with hearing processors so that you have a motor representation of what you're saying that makes, again, the speech more robust in noise. So many of these analog systems have applications in consumer um, uh, gadgets as well. Um, uh, great talk again. I mean, I, everyone's going to say that. But when, when I see the the you're talking about the cell, and I yes. think that's a really interesting approach, and yeah. people should be using that when they're shutting down pathways and yeah. things like that to understand it as well. But you have, I, I keep seeing 30 equations, 30 unknowns, and and what you're talking about, and how do you get good enough data to think that someday that you're going to be able to figure out what's going on to have that many variables that you know that much about? Yeah, that's an excellent question, and it turns out that. Even if you don't have data, you can use this as a rapid exploratory tool. Just like, for example, circuit designers do not know the threshold voltage of every transistor you build. You actually purposely go in and design and simulate saying, well, if there's a mismatch, I have this feedback loop that will calibrate it. And you have some rough range statistically of where the KDs will be. So just like we don't know the synaptic weight of every neuron in our brain, you know, and we're not going to and figure it out, we're not going to know the, the KD, the equivalent in, in the cell of every single KD. But many designs now in synthetic biology and systems biology are looking at it just like neuroscientists study the brain and saying, well, even if we don't know the KD, if this is a positive feedback loop with a high loop gain. That means it's going to oscillate or it's going to have high gain, and it's not going to do that. So you use it as an exploratory or simulatory tool to actually tell you, ooh, what if I change the KD artificially by doing this? What will happen? And you test it. So you have to have a feedback loop between the design, the theory, the simulation, and the biological implementation that cycles back. Time for uh, one more question. Whitney Kalala, Pacific Northwest National Labs. Thank you for a very interesting topic. I'm in the front row. Ah, right here. I was, wow. <laughs> OK. I'm just curious to understand a little bit better if the cochlear implant works for the hard of hearing or deaf for whom the hairs on the inner ear are damaged or gone? And if not, what are research approaches for addressing that group? Yeah, so it works for the profoundly deaf who have more than, say, 80 to 90 dB of hearing loss. Otherwise, you could try and get away with a hearing aid. Usually, hearing aids don't work well beyond 60 dB of hearing loss. But even if you've lost your inner hair cells, as long as the spiral ganglion dendrites are intact, it works for many deaf people. And the reason those spiral ganglion dendr dendrites are often intact is they're protected in this bony case. And so the cochlea is actually a very unique organ in that many of the biological structures are well protected naturally. So even though you've lost all your hair cells, the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells, as long as you have a few surviving dendrites on the spiral ganglions, you're OK. And in fact, if you use, it's kind of a use them or lose them. Because if you, do, if you keep using them and they keep sending information to the brain, they're more likely to stay intact. 
So people are also looking at releasing drugs like BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which will actually promote the growth of these dendrites to get closer so that when you stimulate it, you lower your stimulation thresholds. So the answer to your long, a short answer to your question is yes, it, it does work. Thank you. So let's thank uh, Rahul, Jim, and Eric one more time. Thank you.